Sound is the vocabulary of nature, and ultrasound, well, it's the vocabulary of emergency medicine physicians. And this is going to be a talk focused on just that, what you need to get out and start conducting and interpreting some ultrasound images. This talk is meant for medical students and residents to learn about the different modes, probe choice, and finally ending with an examination of the extended focus assessment with sonography for trauma or EFAST exam. My name is Lauriano Andrade Vicente. I'm an incoming emergency medicine intern whose specialty isn't exactly ultrasound quite yet, but teaching. And so with that combination, I hope that this is the last basic ultrasound video you ever have to watch. Here are the disclaimer. Just don't blame me if something bad happens in your clinic because of something you watched on lecture. And uh, one financial disclosure for this lecture is that I'm an, emboss an ambassador for AMBOSS. Uh, which entails providing insights and ideas surrounding the AMBOSS educational platform, beta testing new features, and serving to spread the word of AMBOSS to fellow medical students and residents. Um, as an AMBOSS ambassador, I receive unlimited access to the AMBOSS platform, but I don't receive a paycheck, and I don't receive commission uh, for any links in this, in this message or in this video. And now we can start the lecture. There's three modes of structural assessment for ultrasound and how ultrasound works is that there's reflection of ultrasound waves at the interfaces of tissues of different densities that allows for the measurement of tissue echogenicity corresponding to tissue density and the return time allows for the determination of the distance between structures visualized um, and the transducer. Now, again, three modes of assessment. So don't worry about how, how they're different or why they're different. Just know that there's three. And this is, again, just functional knowledge for you to pick up the ultrasound and start, you know, ultrasounding. We don't use the A mode anymore. So really, there's B mode and then there's M mode. <clears throat> B mode is your go-to setting for most assessments. And M mode for ED docs anyway is usually just used to evaluate for a pneumothorax. That's structural assessment. Now you can assess direction and flow velocity, and that's the Doppler mode. You throw on the Doppler mode on your ultrasound, that's what you're doing. It's based on the Doppler principle that a moving object will reflect sound waves back at a frequency that is of a different frequency than the original emission frequency, basically because it has its own velocity and it's moving either toward or away from the emission source. <clears throat> you can put on a setting that can be pulsed or continuous, the details of which is beyond the scope of this lecture. Also, you can put it on duplex ultrasonography, which combines Doppler ultrasound with B mode. Um, and if you've been in the clinic, you know that we usually use that to diagnose a deep vein thrombosis, a DVT. And when you do this Doppler ultrasonography, the thing that you won't need to know as a medical student or a resident is how to interpret it. So if you're doing the ultrasound, if you take a look at this picture here that I'm identifying for you now, we see that what looks like a blood vessel there, if you can sort of zoom in a little bit, what looks like a blood vessel there and a red color inside, that red color indicates that the fluid is flowing towards the transducer and the brightness of the red or, or the richness of the red indicates the speed of the fluid flow, which when taken together indicates the velocity as we now have a magnitude in a direction. And that is the principle of Doppler ultrasound. So let me make it easy for you to remember. Here's how you remember it. Blue equals away from the transducer. The fluid is flowing away from the transducer. So the mnemonic is blue away, like blown away from you or the transducer. Also keep in mind that a brighter color means a faster velocity of fluid flow. And if you remember from your physics class from college, flow rate is a constant and it's equal to area of the pipe um, times the velocity of fluid flow. Decrease the area, you increase the velocity. Um, so typically you would think if you're doing this exam, I see an increase in velocity, maybe there's a partial obstruction there, decreasing the area, um, such as an obstructing clot. There are some disadvantages to doing ultrasound. One is basically that the ultrasound sonographer has to be skilled in order to get a quality image. Uh, but two, there are artifacts that can happen. And the biggest one that I want you to know about and let's talk about is acoustic shadowing, which basically is that the ultrasound waves are strongly absorbed and echoed at the surface and the waves 
fail to penetrate the tissue. So all the structures behind that, that uh, tissue will appear black. Most, mostly happens with bones and air, but it's artifactual. It's a false representation of the tissue made by the ultrasound device itself and not something with the tissue per se. That is, it's not an actual representation of what is behind, let's say, that rib, for example. Another example, let's say someone has a gastrointestinal obstruction and they're filled with air. You may have a very hard time doing an ultrasound of, let's say, their pancreas, which is behind that air because the air will cause an acoustic shadow, an artifact, and you won't be able to see behind it. Doesn't mean the pancreas isn't there, it just means that it's just an artifact that makes it difficult to interpret uh, the image. So just to depict what that might look like, here's a video on the right. We can see there are some ribs here as the big bulky black area or the anechoic area and behind it we don't see much and we don't see much because that's the acoustic shadow there. Okay, so basically you just need to keep that in mind and make sure you fan around these things to make sure you get a clear and important, uh, clear image of what you need to see. There are other um, artifacts, but really, I don't think it's really relevant for this basic talk. Some basic terms, hyperechoic means more bright, hypoechoic means more dark, anechoic means black. Frequency and depth, basics here now the lower your frequency the higher penetration aka the higher depth or deeper you get into tissue that is to say that they have an inverse relationship and if there's anything to remember from this slide it is exactly that that penetration depth and frequency have an inverse relationship in fact it's so important that i'm going to say it again they have an inverse relationship increase the frequency decrease your depth and vice versa now the probes Choosing your probe, there are three major probe choices, and they typically look like these choices on the top left here. And that is the linear probe, the curvilinear probe, and the phased array. The phased array, the waves arise from a single point, whereas the linear and curvilinear, the waves spread out evenly, and you'll see that depicted uh, on your image. Uh, the phased array just looks like a square, whereas the uh, linear and curvilinear, they sort of look like a, a triangle fanning out. So the mnemonic is as follows. So the linear probe is called the vascular probe. And it's great um, for more superficial structures owing to its high frequency. Uh, and I like to think of the linear probe as a straight blood vessel to remember its association with vascular use. The curvilinear is the abdominal probe. It's good for deep structures. I use curve your way into the abdomen to remember that this is the abdominal probe. Why are they good for deep structures? It's the low frequency. Finally, the phased array is known as the cardiac probe. It's also good for deep structures and it's really good for movement as well. So I like to remember, I remember the phased array is the cardiac probe by thinking about the cardiac phases for Cardiac probe. Okay, just to summarize again, curve your way into the abdomen. So the curvilinear probe is the abdominal probe, cardiac phases. Uh, the phase array probe is the cardiac probe. And then the linear probe is the vascular probe. And I like to think of a linear blood vessel to remember that. When you're doing ultrasound, ultranographers have a way of describing the way you can manipulate the probe by sliding or rocking, sweeping, fanning, pressure, compression, and rotation. All these are maneuvers you can do to get a better image. Uh, of course, this is very much a procedural skill, so I won't focus on it here. I want to do a quick review on anatomical planes of section, just because we're going to talk about it a lot as we go through this. So, as you can see here, the uh, sagittal plane or okay the longitudinal plane is kind of cutting right through the middle of the face uh, the coronal plane is cutting down uh, in this direction of the body in yellow here and then in a darker yellow the transverse or the axial plane is like cutting the body off I like to think of it as cutting it off on the neck so I'm just gonna go through a mnemonic for how I remember this because it's so hard I think for me anyway to remember it otherwise so here's the sagittal plane. I just drew a lightning strike right through the eye of the sagittal. Sagittal looks like an eye as well. Just to, This is the plane of section right down through the middle of the page. That's also the longitudinal section. 
for the coronal section, I have this coronal section of a heart that reminds me sort of coronary, coronal, and this picture reminds me of that this is that type of section. Uh, and then finally, the transverse, the axial section, I'd like to remember that just cutting off somebody's head. And I have a red ax here to remind us of axial section. Well, so with that said, we can talk about transducer indicator uh, or and orientation or probe uh, orientation and the indicator. So the first step in doing this and the why this is so critical is this sort of sets a standard on how we interpret the image. So the probe orientation is critical. And the first step to doing that is identify the indicator, which is a little small knob or bar protrusion on the side of the probe that is shown here. And that indicator will be in two places. One, it'll be on the probe, and then two, it'll also be on the screen here. And they'll be on opposite sides of the screen. So you want that indicator on the probe to be pointed to either to the patient's head in a longitudinal, or aka sagittal plane, or pointed towards the patient's right if you're in a transverse or axial plane. So it's important to know that this will set the standard so that we will see an image as a mirror image, just like in CT scans and x-rays. <coughs> But keep in mind that echocardiographers will do it in the opposite way, which can be very confusing. But if you're aware of it, maybe it'll help you a little bit. And finally, just to rehash this, uh, in the longitudinal or sagittal view, the left side of the screen correlates with the cephalic or towards the head direction. Okay, And the transverse or axial view, uh, the left side of the screen correlates with the patient's right, just like away from you in a CT scan. So. And let me just also say, and I'll say this again, in terms of left and right, that is the case, but in terms of up and down or near field, far field, uh, the near field, the thing closest to the top of the ultrasound image is going to be the thing closest to your probe. Further away, the deeper it is. Okay, good. Again, the part of the body closest to the probe is displayed at the top of the screen no matter what the direction, whereas near field is area closer to the probe far field area farther away. This is critical because sometimes people get confused. For example, you start to do an ultrasound of the heart uh, and people get confused as to where the, the, ventricle, the, the ventricles are, which one is which. Well, if you remember that the right ventricle is always closest to the skin than any of the other ventricles or atria, you remember that the closest a chamber is going to be the right ventricle every time. So every time the right ventricle is going to be closest to the top of the ultrasound. Again, just to rehash again, in the longitudinal, or okay, the sagittal section, indicator should be towards the head, and that means the head will be on the left side of the screen, feet will be on the right side. In the transverse or the axial section, the indicator is on the right, uh, on the probe that I, that, I, that I mean, and it indicates that the right side is on the left side of the screen, just like any other CT scan that you've done before. And now we can talk about the FAST exam. So FAST stands for Focused Abdominal Sonography for Trauma. It's called Positive FAST Exam if there's free fluid demonstrated in the abdomen. And we use four views to look for that free intraperitoneal fluid that is presumed to be blood in a trauma patient that collects in the dependent areas and appears as hypochoic areas on ultrasound. So, more dark. So sub and parasternal views, you're looking for hemopericardium. If for Morrison's pouch in the right upper quadrant, you're looking for free fluid between the liver and kidney and some other areas. But again, this is just keeping it simple. In the spleno-renal recess in the left upper quadrant, we are looking for free fluid between the spleen and kidney. And in the pouch of Douglas, uh, plus the bladder or the suprapubic region, we're looking for free fluid between the bladder, uterus, prostate, or rectum. So the advantages to this, it's rapid, it's non-invasive, not time-consuming, and it's about 95% sensitive for intra-abdominal blood. Disadvantages is it's operator-dependent, so you have to make sure you get a good image, and uh, it's low specificity for individual organ injury. You don't really know where the blood is coming from, just that the blood is there. Again, the EFAST is adding these bilateral anterior lung views, checking for pneumothorax or hemothorax or what have you. <coughs> And now we can just go through each area here and look at some prototypical images and see if we can help you identify some hemorrhage in a particular area. So the right upper quadrant will be first. So here is the normal right upper quadrant ultrasound. And we will note here uh, first the 
the white stripe that is the diaphragm. So we call that the white stripe or diaphragmatic stripe. And then that delineates for us both the liver and the lung. And we see the lung here and then the liver. And that has a name, it's called mirror artifacts of the lung as an artifactual uh, okay, uh, thing. Uh, should look like the echogenicity of the lung should look like that of the liver and if not you think of a hemothorax um, But anyway, then finally you have the kidney here in between the liver and kidney and how I know that's the kidney by the way is that there is this sort of uh, hy Hypoechoic uh, black appearing tissue and then in between it and inside of it There is this white appearing tissue and that that white appearing tissue is like the renal pelvis is coming together form the renal, the renal calyces is coming together to form the renal pelvises. So that's how I sort of know that that's the kidney. Um, and then in between that, it's Morrison's pouch, which is a potential space between the liver and kidney or the uh, hepatorenal recess. And the goal when you're doing this ultrasound is to make sure you look at the pleural space, the subphrenic space or the subdiaphragmatic space, the hepatorenal space and the inferior pole of the kidney. That's the things you have to make sure you look for. So, okay, uh, this is a normal image now in motion. Again, we can see the diaphragmatic stripe here in white. Let's wait till we go back. Diaphragmatic stripe here in white. Here's the lung, here's the liver, here's the kidney, here would be the hepatorenal space, and here's the inferior pole of the kidney. This person did a great job here. And again, we see that mirror artifact that the lung echogenicity should mirror the liver spleen echogenicity. And it's not, you think of hemothorax. Okay, some abnormal ones. So here is some fluid in Morrison's pouch. That's the space between the liver and the kidney. Um, and we can see here uh, the little sliver of tissue waving high. That's probably part of the liver there. Um, and that's and that black stuff is, is the anechoic fluid. It's, it's a most likely hemorrhage in the trauma patient. We also see some fluid up here as well. Um, and here is a depiction of that in a graphical depiction from Amboss. Here's the diaphragmatic white stripe. Here's the lung. Here's the liver, and here's free fluid in the paddle renal recess, um, known as Morrison's pouch. There are some more pathologic images here. Here's hemorrhage in the pleural space now, and so now we see this black anechoic stuff uh, between the lung and now the diaphragmatic stripe here in white, and the liver is waving high at. I mean, excuse me, the lung is waving high at us, and how I know it's in the pleural space and not the uh, liver area under the subdiaphragmatic area is that the diaphragmatic stripe is tugging tightly against uh, the liver here. So that's how we know. And here, on the other hand, is hemorrhage in the subphrenic or subdiaphragmatic space between the liver and, and the diaphragm. And here we see the diaphragmatic stripe is disconnected uh, from the liver. And we have this black anechoic fluid in between it. So that's how you localize it. Here's hemorrhage in the inferior pole of the kidney. How do I know we're at the kidney here now? Well, one, I'd be doing the exam myself, but two, I see this sort of more anechoic or hypochoic uh, appearing uh, tissue. And then in the, in the middle of it, I see this uh, more hyperchoic, more bright white uh, tissue. Let's me know that's probably the renal calyces forming the renal pelvis. Very good. We move on to the left upper quadrant now. Here's the normal left upper quadrant ultrasound. Uh, now, a lot of rib shadowing here, so the, image, the video quality is not the best here. But here we can clearly see the kidney. You saw that uh, white area surrounded by the more hypoechoic tissue. That's, that's clearly the kidney. And because we're on the left side, we know that this, this structure, which looks like the liver, uh, is the spleen, right? They have the same sort of echogenicity. Um, and then if we look closely uh, to the edge of the spleen here, we can see the white diaphragmatic stripe here. Um, and that's the left upper quadrant ultrasound. Of course, after the diaphragmatic stripe is the lung. And here's a graphical depiction of that diaphragmatic stripe, lung, spleen this time, because we're on the left side, uh, and the kidney. And here's abnormal. It has some fluid in the spleen or renal space. So when you do this ultrasound, you want to make sure you get a view of the pleural space, the subphrenic space, so under the diaphragm, the spleno-renal space, the potential space, and the inferior pole, the left kidney. So here are just some hemorrhage in the pleural space to the left upper quadrant. We have the lung waving high at us. We have the diaphragmatic stripe here. We have the spleen here um, and some anechoic fluid that's most likely hemorrhage in a trauma patient. And here's just a graphical depiction of that same thing. Lung 
diaphragm, spleen, and then we have the black anechoic fluid. Again, here's hemorrhage now in the subphrenic space, so under the diaphragm. In this case, now we see the diaphragmatic stripe is disconnected from the spleen. Um, and then there's black anechoic fluid in between it, so we know we're dealing with uh, free fluid uh, in the left upper quadrant and under the diaphragm. Here's uh, uh, just some more images. Uh, free fluid now in the spleen renal space. Here's the kidney, here's the spleen, here's the nice diaphragm, here's free fluid. Again, just representation of that. And that's the left upper quadrant ultrasound. Now we can do the suprapubic ultrasound. So here is a uh, graphical depiction of what you might see when you place your ultrasound probe in this in the suprapubic region. Maybe some colon on each side, huge structure that is a bladder, and if it's empty, it might just be that it's just urinated. Then you, if in a female, uh, you'll, you'll see the uterus, and then the rectum, and then there may be fluid in the rectal uterine pouch, aka the pouch of Douglas, which you want to check for. But really what you're doing is checking the bladder, checking for any fluid surrounding the bladder, and then checking for fluid in the rectal uterine pouch, aka the pouch of Douglas. And you can either take um, uh, the sort of axial view or the sagittal view. Um, and here is the sagittal view. <coughs> Remember, sagittal view, lightning strike right through the middle of the page. Um, you have the bladder, the uterus, fluid in the rectal uterine pouch, and then here's the rectum. Okay, let's let's get into pathologic now. Uh, so here's just a normal ultrasound of the suprapubic view. It's very clean, clear uh, delineation of the beginning and end of the bladder here. I don't see any other anechoic fluid other than what's in the bladder, which is fine. Uh, and here's just a sagittal view showing the same thing uh, with the bladder. And actually, if you look on either side here, just like in our image to the side, you can actually kind of start to make out anechoic air from the colon on either side. Uh, it's not as clear on this image uh, to see any structure behind the bladder. But of course, remember what I taught you in the beginning of the lecture that uh, what's closest to the to skin is going to be at the top of the screen no matter what. So you always know the bladder's here and you're looking behind that for anything else. <coughs> okay, here again, you're just seeing more some bladder. Uh, it's kind of hard to make out anything else. Maybe I see a little bit of um, probably air from the colon on, on this side here. So here's some fluid now abnormal in the perivesicular area, the peribladder area. So it's just basically just anechoic, very clear anechoic fluid in the in that area. Um, here again is fluid in more perivesicular area. Uh, this is probably colon floating at us here. Here is a severe hemorrhage. Uh, in this case, the the delineation of the bladder is just not very clear. You also see the uterus there for a second in the beginning of the video. There we go. You see the uterus, fallopian tubes. Uh, and now we have the pouch of Douglas here, the rectal uterine space, which is also showing a ton of anechoic fluid. So this is just very, very severe hemorrhage. <coughs> All right. Now, subexiphoid. Uh, the subexiphoid view uh, here is a normal subexiphoid view. So you're using the liver as an anechoic window, uh, acoustic window rather, to get a view of the heart and the peri periocardial uh, space, really, because this is trauma, right? You're looking for cardiac tamponade and things like that, effusions. So here's the liver. Here, again, I told you that the thing that is closest to the skin will always be towards the top of the ultrasound. So again, the right ventricle is the closest thing to the skin. So here's always going to be the right ventricle, either left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium. Um, and this here's just a, a ultrasound in motion of that. Again, here's our liver. We can see that echogenicity. It looks just like before. Here's our right ventricle. Right ventricle must be connected to the right atrium. Uh, and then behind that's left ventricle and then the left atrium. And you really, what you're looking for is just any fluid and buildup between this white stripe, which is the pericardium, uh, which I should have labeled, but the white stripe is the pericardium and the heart itself. So here is that pericardial fusion. So now what you see here is there is fluid in between the periatal and visceral pericardium. Um, 
and that is causing well that is in a few a pericardial effusion which may cause tamponade in a trauma patient so that's why we do this okay now we move on to the efast which really just adds the anterolateral uh, bilateral anterolateral lung views to check for a pneumothorax or hemothorax or what have you so let's do it um so here's a normal anterolateral ultrasound view. And what we can see here, let me bring out my little pointer, is there are some ribs. We'll see some rib shadowing. Um, and then we'll see the lung, which sort of looks like static from a TV. Um, and there are things called A lines and there are things called B lines. Uh, so a stack, so, oh, and let me just not move on too quickly. And then this white area here will be the pleural line. And if this was a video, you would see that this plural line would be marching on like ants on a, on a stick. And if there's a static plural line here, that's uh, ind indicative of pneumothorax. Um, and these A lines, if they're very prominent, we can see those in pneumothorax, COPD, or atelectasis. The B lines are these sort of uh, headlights, uh, B line headlights. Uh, that are absent in pneumothorax, and they can be numerous in something like edema or fibrosis. I'm not going to go into why these are the way they are, uh, but let's just, that's normal, right? So moving on, uh, here is a normal uh, image, just a normal static image, and here is a normal uh, uh, video of an ultrasound. Here are the ribs, a bunch of skin and muscle leading up to the ribs, and here is the lung parenchyma or lung tissue, and we can see this pleural line in white, this white plural line stripe that has this sort of ants on a stick or ants on a log appearance walking, that's normal. That's just the plural moving with respiration. Um, but when that is static, that is indicative of pneumothorax. And so really our goal when we're doing this anterolateral lung is to obtain uh, views of the lung side to assess for pneumothorax. So, that was in B mode. Everything that we've been doing so far has been in B mode on the ultrasound. But now we're gonna move to M mode. So on M mount, on M mode or motion mode ultrasound, the periatal pleura and structures superficial to it, like the skin, the muscle, whatever, they're stationary, they're not moving. And they appear as parallel lines uh, of varying echogenicity. So here's the muscle, here's skin up here, uh, here's pleura, and then here's lung. Um, the visceral pleura and the underlying lung move with respiration and appear grainy on M mode. So here's a sound of granular, sort of TV static appearance. And they resemble sand on the shore. And this, uh, uh, these parallel lines sort of re represent sea waves. So this seashore appearance is normal. But if a pneumothorax is present, this shore pattern is lost. And instead, what you get um, is multiple horizontal lines that are seen throughout the lung, uh, known as barcode sign or stratosphere sign. And that's how you can detect pneumothorax in a, in a trauma patient very easily. So why don't I just show you, I know that can be a little confusing, so let me just continue here. Again, here is just a normal ultrasound um, showing that the ants on a log is walking. And now on this image here, you lose those ants on a log walking, and that's indicative of pneumothorax. That's just the pleural line not moving because the air is uh, disrupting the movement of the pleura uh, with respiration. So that's ants walking on a stick, and that loss of that lateral movement of the pleura during pneumothorax. You also lose the headlights, by the way. If you notice, there, there are some headlights here moving um, and, and you don't really have those anymore in pneumothorax. All right, so here's just trying to depict in M mode what a pneumothorax looks like. So here's the normal appearance. Here is B mode, here is M mode. We have these parallel lines here that are representing the non-moving structures, um, like the skin, uh, the parietal pleura, et cetera. And then here is the lung parenchyma. Now, again, normally this looks like this, okay? Uh, but we lose that shore pattern. So again, here are the waves, here are the waves, here's the shore, the beach, the sandy, grainy appearance of the lung. And here is pneumothorax. Here's normal, pneumothorax, barcode sign. Barcode sign of pneumothorax. So you don't have the sand, uh, the waves hitting the beach anymore, you just have barcode sign, just straight waves. 
And that is uh, the barcode sign of Nomothorak when you put your ultrasound probe in, in, in M mode. That's all I really have. This is just uh, for documentation purposes. If you'd like to use it to help you document your exam, you can do that. Uh, and the last thing I'd recommend our listeners to do is watch this video on YouTube. I can't play it here. That would be copyright violation. Uh, but it's a very good, quick, easy video that recap procedurally how to do this as well as look at some images again. But that's all I have for you. And I have no affiliation with this YouTube video. Um, but that's all I have. I hope you enjoyed the lecture on ultrasound basics and EFAST exam. And if you did, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. And thanks and have a great day.